Welcome to the Katzen Arts Center and to the first event in what we at AU hope will be a long and fruitful partnership with our friends and neighbors at the Washington Ballet. I'm Peter Starr, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And to kick off this evening, it's my great pleasure to introduce American University's 15th president and the first woman to serve in that role, Sylvia Matthews Burwell. She's eager. As you surely know, President Burwell served as the 22nd Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services from 2014 to 2017. In this role, she is widely credited with saving the rollout of the Obama administration's Affordable Care Act. Prior to that, she directed the Office of Management and Budget, served as president of the Walmart Foundation, and spent 11 years at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where she served both as chief operating officer and as president of the Global Development Program. President Burwell earned undergraduate degrees in government from Harvard University and in philosophy, politics, and economics from Oxford, where she was a Rhodes Scholar. It was at Oxford, I gather, that she won first prize in ballroom dance <laughs> for doing a mean quick step. <laughs> Sylvia and her husband, Stephen, are parents of two eagles in waiting uh, Helene and Matthew. Helene is here, having just come from nutcracker practice. Please join me in welcoming President Sylvia Matthews Burwell. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Starr. I uh, appreciate that. And someone's telling tales about uh, my, my time. The quick step was was the specialty at that time. Um, and thanks to all of you all for joining us this evening in our wonderful Cats and Arts Center. We're so fortunate to have this space on our campus. It's a wonderful setting that houses for us the visual arts, the performing arts, and every so often the artifacts, which is an incredible rock band with a lead guitarist who moonlights as the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. <laughs> and a president who moonlights as the band's publicist. Um, whether it's our deans or our faculty or our staff or our students, there's one thing that you'll find here at American U University that no matter where you are or what campus building that you're in, uh, American University is engaged and seeking impact, and we have faculty that are on the cutting edge of their field, students empowered to be creative and impactful, and staff that are helping to push our university forward. And on this campus, we try to live the African philosophy of Ubuntu, which is the idea that I am because we are. And that idea in that idea, we are all bound together by our shared humanity. And that's the same humanity in all of its beauty and complexity that our artists and our performers celebrate every day in this building. And AU's wonderful dance program began with Dr. Naima Prevots, and Dr. Prevots created a program that was an incubator for innovative arts. Under her model, AU was a thriving laboratory, and, and we welcomed artists like Twyla Tharp, like Anna Sokolo, Jose Limon, and today, under Britta Joy Peterson's leadership, we've welcomed art artists like Zoe Schofield and Charles O. Anderson. And today, I am thrilled uh, to welcome another luminary, and we do that with a number of our uh, community here tonight. There are a number of our deans. We have our former president, Neil Kerwin, and Anne, who are here tonight. We have members of our board of trustees. I think Jack Cassell is here tonight. I also see Arthur Rothkopf, and there may be other members. So we are all here as our community to welcome another luminary. And I'm getting to know Julie Kent, fortunately. And Julie holds the record as the longest serving ballerina in the American Ballet Theater's 75 year history. And she held the title of principal dancer and we are so fortunate that she has chosen to return to Washington DC in, in 2016 to serve as the artistic director of the Washington Ballet. 
And the idea for this event actually came about at a dinner um, where I was privileged to meet Julie. And Julie spoke and had a conversation and it was a conversation between two folks and just listened and was very wowed by um, both, of course, what Julie has accomplished, but all that she had to say. And I thought, how can we welcome this wonderful person and this talent to American University and to the DC community and have the opportunity for all of us to be inspired and learn from her? And that is what led to this event tonight, and we're so pleased to have you. And so I'm happy and honored that we will have a chance to learn from your experiences and insights tonight, Julie. It's a wonderful bonus uh, that we're going to be joined by two special artists from right here at American University. Uh, Britta Joy Peterson, who serves as our director of dance at AU, is an internationally produced choreographer, performer, and collaborator. She led the design of our new and award-winning curriculum for AU's Bachelor of Dance, which we just launched this year. And we'll also... <laughs> We're excited about it, as are our students. And we'll also are joined tonight by Andrew Taylor, who is chair of the Department of Performing Arts and a professor of arts management here at AU. Professor Taylor explores the intersection of arts, culture, and business, and is an active practitioner himself, having served as a consultant for the arts and cultural organizations, including Julie's own American Ballet Theater. The pioneer of American modern dance, Martha Graham, once said, dance is the hidden language of the soul of the body. My hope for this evening is that Julie, Britta, and Andrew will shine a light on that hidden language, and perhaps they'll even translate a bit for us tonight. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> It is a joy to welcome you to the Katz and Arts Center uh, in American University. I'm really excited about this um, conversation to come. We're going to have a little uh, preamble conversation to touch on some issue, um, some reflections on her new role, on her artistic practice from her past, and how those blend together into the next chapter of her professional and creative work here in DC. First, I believe we have a short video to sort of set us up um, in an elegant way. Do we? Roll it. Dance transcends words. You can speak in just a different way. I'm a dancer, and I have been pretty much my whole life. I was the longest serving dancer with American Ballet Theater in their 75 year history. And attitude. And I wanted to return to the city where I learned my craft, where I grew up and contribute to the artistic landscape of our nation's capital. DC is unlike any other city. People are coming to this city to pursue something. They're coming to pursue a career in dance. We have dance everywhere. The whole spectrum is happening here. You can pretty much find whatever your flavor is here. I danced on this stage at least once a year for 30 years, so it's my second home. And we are so fortunate that our city has this incredibly fertile, dance-loving environment. There's some real beauty in this city. Both has feelings of antiquity and has feelings of something new and fresh and just hatching. And like it has to be more real. Oh, I love it. There is nothing more inspiring than to see a group of artists in pursuit of excellence. That's what we are doing. We are pursuing excellence in every single way possible. That's what art is supposed to do. It's supposed to inspire that love and interest in others for our community. So there's a bunch of threads in there that we need to tease apart. So just as a first setup for those who might not be aware, what exactly does an artistic director do at a major ballet company? Mm. <laughs> Lots of things. First of all, thank you. Thank you so 
so much. I feel so honored to be here. Um, yeah, so role of an artistic director, um, really to steward the institution forward. And I, for me, the most important part of that title is art, <laughs> because it's the reason why I have that role is my relationship with my art. So how I can use uh, uh, my experience and my knowledge and everything that was uh, given to me and learned, uh, how can I share that with the dancers and how can I position the art form itself uh, to make the greatest impact within our community. So, but it's a, it's a, it's a lot of multitasking, but I, I really try to focus on the, the art. Oh, that's good. So, as the artistic director, mm -hmm. you program the Washington Ballet yes. season. Can you tell us a little bit about how you go about that choice making process, like sure. who the choreographers are, classic versus contemporary works, and how you build a season for right. the ballet? So, I, at the heart of uh, ballet company is their repertoire and mm -hmm. it's a very strong indicator of the caliber of the institution not unlike a museum collection um, if you look at, at the repertoire of a ballet company and you see wow they have Balanchine and Robbins and Ashton and Tudor and and Poking and so you when I arrived here that was where I wanted to start the focus to build um, a, a solid foundation of master work that can set a strong artistic foundation for the dancers. I mean, basically dance is speaking with your body. So when you have a body of, uh, when you have learned uh, a body of work by such a, a diverse range of choreographers um, who have shaped and influenced our art form in such an uh, important way, um, it becomes part of your uh, language mm -hmm. set. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, ha over the past uh, three years, have brought to the repertoire of the Washington Ballet uh, masterpieces by Balanchine, all the choreographers I mentioned, Balanchine, Fokine, Ashton, Kranko, Ratmansky, Tudor, Robbins, um, as well as uh, created two evenings just for the purpose of new work, to explore new voices and, and uh, to cultivate an environment where uh, the, the possibility of a, of a masterpiece that reflects our time mm -hmm. and our experience. And, and uh, I don't, I don't know about you all, but I don't, I don't want to be the known in our generation that we just danced great works from the past. Right. I want to have the opportunity for for great works of now. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, in order to really identify something that's great, you have to have seen it before. <laughs> yeah. And so it's about educating the dancer. It's about educating the institution and building the body of knowledge, the touch points. Uh, of, of the audience so that when you see the spectrum, you can see how all the choreographers influenced each other, mm -hmm. how you get from uh, Petipa to Fokine to Balanchine to Ratmansky uh, as far as the Russian tradition or from um, Cunningham and Paul Taylor and Mark Morris or uh, which is our next program, the Cont American Contemporary Masters program that we're presenting in October. Um, and uh, it's a, for me, it's about connecting dots. And I feel like it, with most things, um, connecting bits of information that uh, from, uh, if you know three things and you know three things and I know three things together, we know nine things. That's fast math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I better not get that wrong here. <laughs> Seven, I think. That's right. So. Um, and I guess just uh, skipping back a little bit, I'm just curious what called you to this place, DC, and right. this company, and this particular role um, of artistic leadership in uh, Washington, DC, at Washington Ballet. So what, what called you to this? Right, well, um, yes, I, I, in early, let's see, in 2015, I, 
came to the determination that my performing career was coming to an end after 30 years at ABT. And um, I, uh, while it's somewhat romanticized and uh, as a ballerina farewell or retirement, um, what it really is is a working mother um, out of work. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was unemployed. I was facing unemployment when I. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I had been working since I was 16 years old. Mm. Like, but singularly, mm -hmm. the same same doors, right. the same Times Square subway commute, the same people, the same locker. I had the same locker for 30 years. Do, do you know, <laughs> I, think we should, I think it bears saying that Julie joined the ballet at 16. Oh, yes. Okay, so just identifying, you know, think of your 16 year old self yes. and stepping into the organization that you would spend, you know, the next several decades at. Yes. I mean, that, that's incredible, right? It was incredible. I mean, of course, at the time, I didn't know what was ahead. Right, of course, of but, course, it's um, a future. It was, it was that, it was all of that, that even just the, the little description we gave, uh, plus the whole coming to terms with the end of your career right. and uh, all of those things. So I took some great advice and I wrote a list about post-performing career goals. Mm. And I, at the top of the list was to share my voice as an American artist, as a dancer, as a woman, as a ballerina, and then to advocate for arts education. Mm. And then below that was to uh, help develop and nurture the next generation of dancers. And then there were other smaller subsets and things, but those were the three sort of big, big items. And I um, was so thrilled to land a job at ABT uh, just on the fourth floor. So all of the dancing happens on the second and third floor. The fourth floor is the education department. And mm -hmm. I was really thrilled with the, I was the artistic director of the summer program. So I had, uh, again, uh, the great opportunity to share my voice and advocate for arts education and help develop the next generation of dancers. Um, but then uh, a few months into that, very few weeks actually, I, I received a call um, regarding if I had any interest in, in, uh, in taking the home of the Washington Ballet. And I really um, was not because I wasn't interested in leaving my life in New York. Right. You know? And so, um, I had two children, very happy in school, and uh, the, um, the whole idea of leaving the life after that I know so well for mm -hmm. 30 years was, was scary. Mm -hmm. um, and over, but they say take the meeting, so I took the meeting. It's <laughs> good advice. Right? It's, it's good advice. It's, that's what they say. So I did that. <laughs> And well, um, and then it progressed, and over a period of, of of months of reflection, I I had to answer for myself some important questions. And of course, um, my husband, um, Victor Barbie, who's here tonight, who has been um, not just my husband, but uh, my best friend and my mentor, and my coach, and my boss, and um, uh, Ha was very, very supportive and helpful in, in coming to these uh, decisions. But at the heart of it was um, two, two sort of personal things and, and one really professional thing. And, and the personal aspects were I wanted to be that person that accepts the challenge um, because I really wanted to show that example to my children. Mm. Um, I. I felt that um, knowing that in few in few years' time they'll come to me and say, "Mom, I have this great opportunity, and I'll be their biggest cheerleader." But if you don't have the courage to to actually take on that challenge yourself, then how can you give advice uh, with real honesty? And so that was pretty com that was a compelling reason. I also I wanted to show their mother in a leadership role. I felt like it was, in, and my husband was just, you know, Julie, it really is a logical next step for you. Um, it's just a matter of time. 
And then the more directly to your question, it was where. And the idea of contributing to the artistic and cultural landscape of our nation's capital is one of the greatest honors and privileges and thrills that you could have. I mean, uh, not only is it our nation's capital, but it's also where I was born and where I learned my art. I was born at the Bethesda Neva Hospital and went to ballet school and in the mall with the carousel <laughs> uh, that's torn down now. But, mm -hmm. and, uh, but it's also this really very, very important city that um, I really want my art that I love so much to be represented here by this community, mm -hmm. not brought in and sort of, you know, touring company come in and yes, it's available to you, but actually as a reflection of us. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's, to some people maybe that's not a probable difference, but to me, it's a very important difference. Um, and so that, I never give short answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that is the long story. It's a long story. <laughs> and I guess as we, before we pivot to the artistic career, I think just the question of what is ballet in DC? So you've had three decades in New York and clearly touring all over the world, so it wasn't just New York, but what is it that you imagine is the voice of, of uh, the Washington Ballet, um, the aesthetic, the feel, the, right. the sort of quality that you think this place Yes, um, calls well, for. I think it's at the root of it and what I alluded to in the video is, is excellence. I mean, excellence isn't defined by size or scale. It's defined by the quality of the product. Mm -hmm. And um, it's also not defined by it's just this or it's just that. If you have, if you, if you present excellent dance, whether it's the most classical, the Sleeping Beauty is our next production after our Contemporary Masters program. So our goal as uh, the ballet company of the nation's capital is really to present our art in its finest form. And it's not about the size and scale of the production because again, it's really about the quality of the offering. Um, and that's where, again, the focus on the art, the art itself uh, is where I and Victor and our artistic staff and our whole um, uh, artistic team is really focused on the quality of the art. And, and then our, our broader um, culture at Washington Ballet is really um, about the pursuit of excellence and, and representing throughout um, our institution um, this sort of aspirational, the, the artist's pursuit. I mean, we all know this as artists, that the whole, um, the whole point of view of an artist is um, not seeking perfection, it's seeking improvement. A dancer starts every day at the bar uh, in first position, whether you're a student at American University or whether you're Natalia Makarova. Like, we all just start where we finish the day before and we try to improve, we build, we move forward. And that kind of, it's very inspiring. It's like the fountain of youth. You know, that's because each day has the potential to be better, the potential to just, you know, the detail, the, the, all of those things that uh, differentiate, be, differentiate between good and great is our focus as dancers every day. And, um, if that can sort of be uh, crystallized and resonate into the community as the sort of great artistic pride of, of our city, that's, that's what our, you know, that's in a sort of metaphorical way, that's our, our goal. And then to be realized by the quality of our performances. Thank you. Yeah. Lovely. So, uh, thinking of excellence, thinking of improvement, um, the pursuit of improvement, I love that. Um, we'd love to hear a little bit about your work as a performer mm -hmm. and um, specifically, I'm curious if there's any particular role or process that you felt was really pivotal in your journey as 
uh, performer who seeks excellence? Mm -hmm. right? Is there one that stands out? Well, I had quite a, I mean. <laughs> a rich career, right? Yes, yeah, I had yeah, a very yeah. rich career, but I think um, very few of us are born great at anything, mm -hmm. okay? And mm -hmm. I'm certainly one of those people. I just had the benefit of a lot of really, really great people that helped me. Mm -hmm. And I was so fortunate to have the opportunity to work with just an incredibly large spectrum of very talented people who believed in me or mm -hmm. saw something in me and wanted to help me. Mm -hmm. um, now that being said, um, especially because we have students in the audience, uh, what my husband always reminds me is that I also inspired that interest in those teachers. Mm. And uh, with what I did with the information they gave me. Mm -hmm. So when you're a student, you're not necessarily seeing through the eyes of the person that's helping you because you're so outward focused. But whatever, I was able to take what they gave me and put it in, and then something came out that then inspired them to give me more, and mm -hmm. I took more, and then over 30 years, I became a ballerina. Mm -hmm. And there were, of course, some big bumps in the road, like everyone, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and to think that there will never be bumps is, is it's fantasy. Of course there's bumps. It's just how you get over them. Yeah. You know, everybody's going to have bumps. <laughs> There's no paver you can push ahead of you. It's how you handle the bumps. And so to give you a specific example, um, one, one moment was when I was making my debut in Manon. Okay, so my first roles, uh, principal roles with the American Ballet Theater were um, the Heroine, so Giselle, Ro Juliet, Caroline, and, and um, Anthony Tudor's Chardin Olila. So um, obviously, I was was a young woman, so I was <laughs> playing. But the ingenue, I guess, is the yeah. best descriptive word. <laughs> so then I am cast as Manon, who is is not an ingenue, and uh, I had wa <laughs> I had watched the I had been in the ballet and watched the ballet and watched. Alessandra Ferry and some other wonderful ballerinas. And, and I had in my head like what I wanted to look like. And I was trying so hard to get it to look the way I wanted. And I was not making progress. And it was really frustrating. Mm -hmm. And it was um, sort of, uh, I was getting input from the maestro came in. It, you should do this and that. And the pianist. Julishka, be more, you know, try <laughs> this, you know. I mean, everybody was giving me input. Oh, God. And, yeah, and I thought, oh, yeah. And so, you know, my, my husband, Victor, who, I'm not sure if he was my husband at that time, at that, or not. <laughs> but, um, you know, he really made it clear to me that I really needed to know how Menon felt. And then whatever I did would be right. Mm. So that the movement, was inspired by the emotion. Mm. So it wasn't that she did this because she liked how it looked. She did this because she knew she wanted him to feel a certain way. Right. Or she, fe she felt a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so that inspired the movement. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, it's a very subtle difference, but one has an authentic quality that mm -hmm. resonates and makes people feel something mm -hmm. and another just looks like couldn't look good or couldn't look bad but it does it's not it's not I don't know it just well it's representation yes yeah so yeah. so that's a moment mm -hmm. but it was there were tears right Victor there were tears <laughs> and there was a lot of but a great teacher just yeah. break it down like let's as you said let's Detangle the threads. Let's get to scene by scene. What are you feeling here? How are you? What? Do you, how do you get from this scene to that scene? A lot of our work at ABT is narrative. It's storytelling, mm -hmm. and unless you really know how the story unfolds, you can't become a good storyteller. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th that's just one example of thousands of of. Um, 
of what, how lucky I was to have that person to help me figure out how to tell a story with authenticity and realness, and then the physicality is inspired and informed by the sensitivity and sensibility of you, you, yeah. you know? Um, and let's, we're not even gonna talk about 32 fuetes. Sure, that's fine, <laughs> that's fine, <laughs> that's fine. But there was a lot of help with, you know, getting all of the physicality and getting yourself to where you needed to be to, to just phys do physically, physically as yeah. a, a, the, the actual technique, the demands of the technique of our art form. Right, the you athleticism. Know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's how do you, you know, cross the finish line and do, do, push yourself and manage your instrument and mm -hmm. manage your lifestyle and, and not obsess about things instead of working forward. You know, it, it, there's, there's just a tremendous amount that was taught, shared with me and helped. And so that, that is just such a huge benefit for our dancers now that I can help them navigate the very, very complicated terrain of a dancer. Um, and and uh, hopefully at the end of the day, leave them with careers that have meant so much to them and that they love so much and that the art form that that gave them this life that they will be inspired to steward it and shepherd it and make it relevant and keep it going as mm -hmm. I I am now so my role now is really just a, it serves as a debt of gratitude to my art form and to those who who helped me to have the career I had mm -hmm. um, what, what role have you performed the most? Um, I would say either, I would say Ro Juliet, Swan Lake, and Giselle, probably the... The, the big three. The top, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, can you tell us a little bit about the difference between originating a role mm. and then and then stepping into right. some someone that yes. you know well like rat like stepping into Giselle versus being the originator of right. a of a piece well they're both incredibly rewarding um, i love i mean i love being the muse i mean yeah. you know that's really a very um it's a, it's a very beautiful and interesting collaboration with the choreographer. It's very different depending on who the choreographer is. Mm -hmm. um, but sort of, I always think of it, the metaphor and I have in my mind is you, when you walk in the studio, when you're creating a piece, it's just a what big white canvas. Mm -hmm. And it's just how you put your signature and your footprint and your body in, mm -hmm. into it and make it your own. And, um, there's great satisfaction in that, especially if the ballet has legs and lives on. Well, right. So much new work is, you know, it's just the benefit is really in the process this itself. It's not necessarily that it's created and it's going to be lasting and you'll see it over and over. But what the dancers and the choreographer and the audience that supports the experience get out of it is really the heart of uh, how you develop an artist, you know, again, yeah. you don't just, you're not, not just great, you get great by the process and then taking it to the next level and again, the building that mm -hmm. I was referring to before. Now, bringing to life a role that has been danced many, many times or by many different legends um, is also exciting and somewhat daunting because you have big shoes to fill. Mm -hmm. um, there's a standard measure. I mean, there's, a, there's an expectation. There's an expectation. And so you have to manage that. Um, and for me, I was always very supported by Kevin McKenzie, our artistic director, and by Victor, who um, always supported my exploration of my own Performance. I was all, oh, and my my coach or mentor Georgina Parkinson, who is a ballerina with the Royal Ballet, she she would always just say, "Give a performance," you know. <laughs> she was like, she was so supportive of me, just giving my performance, not be more 
like this or be more that or you know so I what although um, my, I, I in my um, work my portrayals of those great roles were singularly mine you know um, they weren't sort of an impersonation of somebody else's mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, I'm good with that yeah <laughs> So I wonder, I'm just pivoting then to your, your next chapter, your new chapter, this chapter, where yes. you are um, a civic leader, institutional leader, community leader, sort of an animator of uh, both the artistic and the, the cultural life of DC. I'm curious what you bring from your process and your practice uh, into that work. And there's already some great stuff you've given us about we all start in first position. Right, yes. Um, and then it's not about perfection, but about improvement. That's pretty useful. I'm going to use that one. Um, <laughs> and this idea that movement, um, so much of management and, and community leadership is about behavior mm -hmm. and not about intention and emotion before mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. So it just strikes me there's a bunch of ways that you might uh, draw upon your creative practice, your creative process in this yes. reaching into the DC community and doing what you do for I you. definitely rely on the same methods and approach that have been so much a part of my life as a dancer. Um, knowing how we start here and we have to get there. And you don't just get there because you want to get there or you get there by first of all doing the work to get there. And you do the work hopefully in a very linear way where you build each day forward, going forward, working towards that goal, working, working, working. And so th it, that's um, as far as how uh, our approach to the great aspirations and exciting um, hopes and dreams that we have of, of where we want to take the Washington Ballet and how we want it to uh, interface and impact our community. We have a, a huge school, so we have we have a, a very large reach already into the community. But um, again, it's where do you how how can you do it better? You know, how can you do just uh, add to that experience and build on it? And it's a it's a methodical approach, and and I'm so grateful for so much of the training that that. Um, my life as a dancer has given me that I also think it's honestly achieving a certain, getting to a certain level in any field, I think how you get there is very similar in all different um, fields. And that's what I find fascinating because they look very different and the language is different. I'm always, I'm, this has been an interest, I, I love words, and um, I find the, the language of administration fascinating. <laughs> um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, cheers to that. <laughs> um, but it's, I, I love it, um, and I, but I also realize that it's a, it's a way to communicate, you know, it's the, it's the specificity of the words and how if you need the message to change, you have to change the words. You can't just use the same language all the time, and so right. having really good words to articulate what it is that you want in, in an administrative setting or um, it's, it's very important. In dance, it's, it's a different, I mean, we have fondue, dégagé, plié, arabesque, shape the line, your foot, wing, like we have all kinds of words that uh, people that aren't dancers would be, <laughs> it sounds, my friend, it's like, it sounds like food groups, you know, <laughs> fondue and frappe, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a trip to Starbucks. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I'm grateful for, for those overlaps. And I always love to discuss with others those similar, the, the parallels. And I mean, clearly there's, there's differences too. But that, you know, art is supposed to, to 
bring us together. And yeah. so. mm -hmm. You know, it's funny from the management side, a bunch of management theory uses artistic language as if, you know, a business is like a theater production, it's like an ensemble, it's like a dance. And yeah. I often want to say, have you ever actually been <laughs> to a dance company right. to and see said, what a mess that is? A ballet company is like a boardroom. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, um, just not actually seeing the, uh, the rigor and the depth and the sweat and the work and the, the mess that gets you to that beautiful moment. Uh, and you're all working so hard on the stage, but it looks like you're floating. Um, yeah. So I just love how business loves to sort of adapt the metaphor of artistic practice, but mm. doesn't quite get Right. What that means, yeah. which is more of the things you're talking about, is leading with intent and emotion and just getting better and starting in first position and going. So I'm, we're excited to see how that, that works. And I know we have some, uh, a question around um, advice. Uh, right. I want you to just be ready because we're going to pivot then to um, questions from you. Um, and we want to spend some time doing that. But So knowing that there's many a student um, student artists, student performers, student managers, um, student mathematicians, student audio technologists, right? Like we have lots of students present in this space. What is it, what advice would you give to your 18 to young self? <laughs> yeah, like 18 to 20 year old self. What advice would you give as somebody who's leading, you know, a really, um, you know, thick career that's right. full of art and community building? Well, there's, there's tons of advice that you could give, but... Or like Julie now, talking to Julie then. Right. I, I, think, I think that one thing, especially in relationship to my field, is... Um, in general, I think you are mostly remembered for the person you are and not for your work. So, especially by your colleagues, and they, you may, they, they will be part of your life forever. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I, that's, a, that's, a, that's an important legacy, sort of uh, making sure that you uh, build a, a path forward founded on sort of integrity and, and good principles. Um, How do you find integrity? Huh. Not to well, put you on the spot, yeah, but... <laughs> no, but no, it's good to have hard questions. Um, I, I think it's a, an inner truth, I guess. It's something that you believe to be true mm. and something that um, you are willing to defend. You know, yeah. I, I think that that's... Um, how I would sort of define it to yeah. myself. Um, and people, whether or not, they, they can recognize that, I think, in individuals, even if what that they're sort of putting their flat platform on isn't of interest to them or it's something, you can still see it. Yeah, right wow, right. that mm -hmm. person, they really believe in that. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of, that they that kind of integrity that they have to that is, is recognizable and admirable. Mm. And so I, I think that that's, that is what I, uh, when after, especially in, you know, for me, I have a unique career because a dancer's life is, as a performer, is very short, you know, so mine was long, but in general, uh, you're looking at um, the, your performing career certainly ending, you know, in your 30s, 40s, or, or early 50s. And mm -hmm. so that's a long life to live where you're not actually doing your art. Right. <laughs> so right. you want to make sure people remember not just, oh, that performance 40 years ago, but remember the person that, that Julie. you are yeah. as well. So yeah. 
I don't know if that's a good answer. <laughs> I think it's a lovely answer. We'll take it. Yeah. That's what we got tonight. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to open up the space for some questions. Um, and per the tradition of American University, we're going to take the first question from a student. Um, and then we'll have time for several. So we don't all have to shoot our hands up at once, but like Marita just did. <laughs> um, but who, um, who has a question? Great. Let's start with Marita, because she was very excited. There's, there's microphones and we have coming a microphone. so everyone can hear you. And yeah. It adds a little bit more pressure, so this is great. Yeah. Hi. So Hold it nice and high. Thanks. Hi. Some people have heard this story, but so I'm not American. I'm actually from Cyprus which is like a tiny island next to Greece. It's like so small, we have no national ballet company, we have no dance companies whatsoever. And I'm really happy to be here asking you this question because I remember being in my room a couple of years ago watching your YouTube video of your last performance at oh. EBT. And <laughs> I've, I never had seen your performances, but in a way you and many of your colleagues at EBT taught me ballet. Because I lived in a community where outside the studio, my only resources were literally books and YouTube. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, just, I was just wondering, like, you and your colleagues and colleagues from other companies as big as ABT, do you ever consider, realize that your work doesn't only shape the American dance landscape, but also the international landscape, especially in communities where ballet is something so not integrated and something so foreign. Right. Well, thanks, Marita. Thank you. And uh, thank you for sharing such a special moment in my life with me. <laughs> um, you know, the, when I started my career, you know, it was the height of the Cold War. And um, you know, Ronald Reagan was president. The internet really wasn't even a, a conception at that point. Uh, so um, the, the understanding that, uh, any, that YouTube and you can Google Pavlova and, and any number of performances and see is still somewhat uh, not, it's not right at the top of my mm -hmm. brain. It's sort of, oh yeah, <laughs> Google it. <laughs> but um, so probably no. I don't think that we are uh, cognizant of, of that appetite uh, in places that don't have the, expo the ability to go and see right for your, and I'm so happy for it. And I'm happy for it for now because in my role of just researching and um, creating pro productions, uh, where we will be staging our own production of Sleeping Beauty. It's so fascinating to research on YouTube and all of the different productions you can go back so far. It's a black Even hole. if it's just a little excerpt, you get a sense of it and it's a fascinating thing. So. Well, I'm, I'm very glad to have inspired you in Cyprus. Thank mm -hmm. you. Do another student? We should do one more student. Eliza? Where's the mic? <clears throat> no, so, so we want to use the mic so that um, our folks who are hard of hearing and then for the folks who are watching via video. Oh, thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question was, when you're looking for a dancer to work with in one of your performances, what's like the first thing that you look for? Do you look for like ballet technique and then um, like type of person that they are, like what's like the list, or if you have a list, like what's right. the way that you choose somebody that you want to work with? Right. Well, it's, it's, it's difficult, um, especially when there's so few spots. So generally, it comes down to, first of all, man or a woman. Do you need another man in the company or do you need a wo another woman in the company? And then it comes down to, um, I, it's never a decision in a, in a vacuum. It's sort of how does this, how will this dancer fit into the landscape of the whole? Um, so it's not, because no dancer doesn't just appear on by themselves. So it's a sum total and then, um, so that, that's a little bit of a, that's a much more specific criteria when you're actually uh, 
considering dancers for a position in your company. But for what, what, do I, what, what do I look for in identifying somebody that I feel has, uh, um, that grabs my attention? It's a lot of different things. It's an interest. Uh, how you're looking at me now, it's like this hunger, you know, I want to hear what you have to say and I'm not so insecure that I can't take what you tell me and, mm -hmm. and not sort of take it in. And that may sound um, like it's an easy thing to do, but it's not, especially if you're insecure. <laughs> you know? And so it's a kind of, you have to, I guess it's based on trust. That's the thing. If you innately sense that you that person trusts you and that you can share them, share with them what you're thinking and feeling, and help, and that they will then receive what you have to say and want more. Um, that's a big thing. Um, and then it's somewhat of a how you handle stress. It's a stressful thing when you're in audition and people are evaluating you. And so having an, a confidence in yourself that you can stand up to it um, and maintain a sense of humor or sense mm -hmm. of, just a sense of, it's not a, oh, it's a life right. or death. If I don't get this job, I'm a, oh, you know, that's, that's not handling the stress well. Um, <laughs> Um, and an openness, obviously, there's, then there's the whole dance. We haven't even talked about dancing yet. We're just talking about <laughs> right, the person. being a person. Yeah. yeah, and then, but it's, there's never a shortage of good dancers. It's very, very rarely the dance itself. Right. It's the, it's the person, you know, and then you see the person influences the dance, mm -hmm. and so, um, yeah. We took uh, the students, we went, we were at the American University, or the American College Association's conference, and one of the panelists was talking about how dancers have gotten so good. Yes. And, and how we really are at a place in our field where the, the, the dancer is almost a superhero because they are so skilled, which is a really beautiful time to live in. Yeah, there's no shortage of talent or great yeah. dancers. There's shortage of contracts. Right, <laughs> right. Well, and, and people, the people who have what you're talking about. So it's, it's not just being a skilled dancer. It's about being a person who's interested in entering the process with authenticity and who strives for excellence, like you spoke about. That's great. Let's get another question we have. This gentleman on the side, he with the microphone. And then uh, now that the uh, Me Too movement has entered the world of dance, what are the special challenges in an art form where there's constant close con physical contact? And could that actually cause dancers to be more cautious, which I guess is not a good thing? And secondly, during your long career, could you have sensed that there were cases of harassment or these, you know, Me Too issues? Okay. Um, your first question, I think it's um, definitely the responsibility of the organization to create a safe environment where people feel safe <laughs> and feel that they have support if there is anything happening that feels uncomfortable or not right or something that is clearly not right, you know. Um, and that's, I mean, that's just, that, that, I, that's not special. That's just should be, uh, that's what it is. That's what it needs to be. So we, we certainly, um, create, that's a requirement of, of our company and our experience. Um, again, I think the, the, to your, the second part of your first question about will it, does it affect dancers considering the intimacy of our work? Not really. I mean, I certainly haven't seen it because the foundation of our relationship, again, is on trust. I mean, 
you are throwing yourself into the arms of your partner and you're trusting they're going to catch you. <laughs> and you are, a dancer's life is such a, it's such a close community that is very, very intimate. I mean, it's a physical art form. And so you're, you have to be, you sign a sort of contract of trust that, that you're going to um, allow yourself to be vulnerable in front of people. In fact, that's what you're supposed to do. And that's, that's the real beauty of our art form is that we, are, we allow ourselves to be completely vulnerable, not just in front of our friends and colleagues, but on a, on a stage. Um, they both take, one takes more courage in front of thousands of people, and I think the other is trust. Um, so, uh, as far as um, the second question, which was? Second question was, um, Whether you did you complete. sense any Oh, of in that? my career, did yeah. I have any? Um, I mean, no. I, I, I was never, ever put in a position, um, certainly if I have to think this hard <laughs> then about it, yeah. I, I'm very proud of that. And what that a privilege, right? What, what a privilege. Yes. That, yeah, what a privilege. So, and it shouldn't be um, a lucky privilege, me. let's say that too. L but lucky me. I mean, I, it wasn't a part of... No, I never, and uh, honestly, I mean, I joined ABT in 1985, and you wouldn't believe um, how many people said, oh, look out for so-and-so, or look out for so-and-so. Never happened. Nope, mm. I was, I was a, I was a young, naive, inexperienced 16-year-old, and, um, I was, again, just very well shepherded and well guided, and, and I'm very proud of the institution that I worked in that um, I didn't experience any of that, and it's also a reflection of the leadership, and um, as for the bulk of my career, the leadership was Kevin McKenzie as artistic director and Victor Barbie as associate artistic director, and I mean, I think it comes from the top. And now you're the top. Yeah. <laughs> so that will, that will hopefully influence your experience. In the fourth row, and then, yes, I noticed a couple more hands. Thank you. Uh, how old were you when you started ballet, and how soon after that did Hortense von Secker realize that you had special talent? <laughs> I'm just going to repeat the question. So the question was, how old was Julie when she started, and how quickly did she recognize her skill and talent? My, my teacher, Hortensia von Secker. Well, I started ballet at Somerset Elementary after school program when I was seven in the cafeteria, and Mrs. Fonseca was my teacher. And then I went to the Maryland Youth Ballet twice a week when I was eight years old. And um, I think Mrs. Fonseca could identify that I had very beautiful ballet feet uh, when I was very little, because everybody used to ask me, point your feet, point your feet. <laughs> I didn't really know what I just did. Did I that? And they, this is how it was? Yeah, they seemed, okay. to like, they seemed to like the bump on the top ah, of my foot. Yes, and I yes. thought, oh, is that good? I mean, <laughs> why would you think? Great. You know, it's just that, that part of ballet is a little weird. Mm -hmm. But um, that there's this obsession with the foot. But anyway, they seemed to like that. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, I wasn't like a child prodigy. I was just um, a child. I love ballet, and I was very. My mother was also a teacher, and so she really guided me and shepherded me very well. Um, and my older sister studied ballet, so it was a family activity. And it wasn't really until I started um, uh, receiving scholarships to summer programs and stipends and I was winning some competitions and and then um, you know my mother said I think you might have something and mm. I said oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah it, but it was a very fast from age 13 to 16 is where really it just kind of all 
went from, I don't know what I'm going to do when I grow up to, oh, I'm an ABT. Okay. This, <laughs> I guess that's what's happening. That's the trajectory. <laughs> that's right. I, I just want to add, I have some pictures which I couldn't find of when Mrs. Fonseca brought you back to Somerset School to oh. demonstrate to the other little oh. kids. Oh, oh. Oh, I'd cool. like to see I'll that. If I ever find them, I'll drop them. <laughs> That's nice. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. You want to pick another student? Uh, Scout. Hi. Hi. Um, so we've touched briefly on um, the vulnerability involved in dance and also the amount of self-discipline that it takes. Um, I was wondering what habits you've sort of picked up um, to take care of yourself and make sure that uh, like the self-discipline balances with a sort of self-compassion. Um, and sort of what you would say to younger artists who are trying to find that skill. Right. Well, being a dancer is one of the requirements, um, for better or worse, is being very self-absorbed. Sorry. <laughs> 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 it's really challenging for the people around you. <laughs> However, it's that constant checking of where you are in your physical, I mean, it's a physical art form, so how is your instrument doing? Is it tired? Is it rested? Is it fed? Is, it, is this inspired to make this move? Um, and so when you're younger, it's easier because you are less responsible for other people and other things, you know, it's a, and you're young. So you bounce back fast and you got more energy and you just make it happen. Um, but I think where I really, again, I, I learned so much from my husband who, who guided me and he, his career at ABT was 42 years uh, and still performing um, 42 years on the stage. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's amazing uh, what, what, he, um, what he contributed and how he managed and then and then helped manage this ballerina, uh, sort of keep it, keep it moving forward. Um, but one of the things that really did help me uh, more specifically to the, the wonderful words that you used um, was when I became a mother and I was responsible to taking care of another human and making sure it was well fed and well rested. And then I thought, oh, that's how you should be taking care of yourself. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> making sure you have eat the rainbow and uh, not just the fast. I only have time to have, I'll have a Starbucks or whatever. But, you know, and I thought, oh, you know, so whenever now when I um, give that advice to young people, I'm like, you know, you need to look after yourself as if you were looking after a baby, you know, somebody that you, you care so much about that you want to make sure grows up well. And we don't always look at ourselves in that lens, especially um, uh, when you're so focused on something and, and want, to get, want to get there. So I, I think that's, I learned a lot from, from that, uh, from mother, I mean, I learned so much from motherhood in, in the huge, many, many ways, but as far as taking care of your physical body, I think that really um, helped. Lovely. I think one more, don't you one think? One more. This gentleman, here. Get the microphone. Hi, my name is Ryan. Uh, I'm a, a very interesting confluence of everything here. I'm a, a proud AU grad. I am actually a former uh, student, uh, Professor Taylor here in the Arts Management Program, uh, performer in the Department of Performing Arts, and now actually a member of the board of the Washington Ballet. So I am uh, thrilled to be here, and it's through all this confluence that I ask this question, and that in this, it, through two things, one through the, 
uh, through the lens of a threatened arts landscape where uh, arts funding and I'd say even the NEA itself is under threat at times, uh, and also in a broader entertainment landscape where there's more entertainment options for between Netflix and Amazon and everything and YouTube and uh, also the other forms of performing arts that are all around. I'd love to have you try to make the case, as I try to do as an ambassador for the ballet and even as a AU, as AU grad as well, why does ballet matter? Like, why should someone go to the ballet? I know. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is a good board member. <laughs> um, you are so right. Uh, and there is so much entertainment available at our fingertips in a screen and but there is nothing more moving and beautiful to watch the manifestation of the culmination of years of devotion and discipline and love and time all culminating in something made just for you, the audience. Just to share that with the audience. Um, and then the curtain comes down. And what happens to the dance? They just go back to work. They just go back to the bar and they try to make it even more beautiful the next day. And that, it's so inspiring to think people commit their lives to do that, just to give you that moment in your life where you feel like we're connected just without words. We don't even need to talk. We just need to move. And, and we have the, the beautiful sister of dance music. So we get to just really celebrate what it is to be human in such a very divine and organic primal way, you know? And so you have this beautiful sort of, there's something that's just so old and then there's something that's so, yeah, the divinity in dance that just is really makes you feel grateful to be human. And so I don't, necessarily get that on my iPad, although, you know, I like Netflix too, but I don't, <laughs> I don't feel the same, and so, um, and, uh, yeah, is that, that a good enough answer? A good I think that's a good, yeah. <laughs> Good. So uh, I want to thank Julie Kent. Let's give her another. Thank you. <laughs> Let's go, <man. clears throat> um, I'm grateful for Britta Peterson, for President Burwell, for Dean Starr, for American University, and for Washington Ballet. This is a first chapter, we hope, in, in what will unfold to be all, all sorts of adventures together. Right. Um, right. And I know I'm walking away from this knowing I need to start in first position. Yes. I need to stop worrying about perfection and, worry, and focus on improvement. And I love this idea of the big white canvas that's just any room you walk into. Um, so you've already given me extraordinary gifts, and I know we're all grateful for the time and energy and attention. And we're so excited for the next chapter of thank Washington you. Ballet. So thank you all, thank you all for coming. <laughs>